All right, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we'll get this started pretty quickly here. Um, I'd just like to thank you guys for coming. Thank Councilor Nave for being here. He's the first district councilor. His area covers, uh, you know, the uh, house that was affected. We have Mayor Walsh here with us today. We have Chief of Fire Mike Mons. We have uh, our Deputy Chief Zach Smith. He was the incident commander um, for the incident on Tuesday. Uh, we have Captain Joe Fennell and Lieutenant Ed Lehman, part of our investigation team. And we have Deputy Chief Jamie Farewell, who is another Deputy Chief who helped manage this scene the other day. Um, to get started, I'd like to invite uh, Mayor Walsh up. Thank you, Chief Craner. Good afternoon, all. Um, before I turn it over to Chief Mons to provide the details uh, in an update on the investigation, I just want to reiterate a few points that I've made since the incident. Uh, it's been a, a long, hot, and challenging past 48 hours or so. Uh, I want to make sure that the families involved know that our thoughts and prayers continue to be with you all throughout the recovery process. Um, uh, we're, we're still thinking and praying for all of you, but especially uh, the two little ones that continue to be in critical condition. Chief will provide, a, um, again, an update on, on the current conditions. Um, I will say it's been heartwarming to see the outpouring of support coming from the community, uh, from the neighbors, both the ones that were on the scene before anybody else, uh, to, the, to the neighbors throughout the neighborhood who have been stepping up, offering support. Again, all of the responding agencies uh, really came together and, uh, and wrapped their arms around these families. Um, I do want to specifically, specifically acknowledge all the agencies involved. As I mentioned, I've been to a lot of critical incidents uh, over the past six and a half years. Uh, I'm not sure that I've ever seen this level of response with so many different agencies uh, and so much collaboration, coordination, and communication. It was really impressive to see, and I'm incredibly proud of our fire department, our police department, uh, and the other, uh, the other departments and agencies involved. So again, uh, I think it's important to name them. So of course, the Syracuse Fire Department and the Syracuse Police Department, uh, the Office of Code Enforcement for the City of Syracuse, Department of Public Works, uh, our partners at American Medical Response, or AMR, Ambulance Service, Onondaga County 911, National Grid, Task Force Two of the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, Office of Fire Prevention and Control. They were the, uh, the office that brought in the two live rescue dogs. Uh, New York State Police from Marcy, New York. Uh, they brought in their cadaver dog. Centro provided a bus with air conditioning for the rehydration and rehabilitation of the firefighters and first responders on scene. The Red Cross, of course, as they always are, was on scene. New York State Public Service Commission, Local Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, AKA the ATF. The Onondaga County District Attorney's Office, Upstate Hospital, several career fire departments that offered their assistance to Chief Mons and his team, and the Onondaga County Department of Emergency Management. I want to recognize the public officials that I was in touch with uh, during the process, including Governor Hochul, who reached out uh, and offered, certainly offered her support as evidenced by the state agencies involved, County Executive McMahon, and of course, Councilor Nave. Uh, this is very personal to him. This is his district, this is his neighborhood, and he was there throughout the incident. Um, I also want to acknowledge our new American community. We are a proud re refugee resettlement community. Uh, this past year, we've uh, resettled upwards of 2,500 new Americans. Um, that requires a lot of support in the best of times, let alone in tragic incidents like we experienced uh, on Wednesday evening. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, all of the uh, members of the new American community who have stepped up uh, and demonstrated unity and support during this great time of adversity. I especially want to acknowledge the New American Forum, the CYO, Catholic Charities, Interfaith Works, uh, and other organizations that have supported the families uh, throughout and will need to continue to support the families going forward. Again, I want to acknowledge and thank everyone involved, community members. I heard from a lot of people didn't live on the north side, didn't even necessarily live in the city, but just wanted to know how to help these families. Uh, again, I, it's one of the things that I'm most proud about of this community is uh, how much we wrap around our arms around each other and support each other, especially in difficult times. And I just want to, again, acknowledge that the difficult times are not through. Uh, the family has uh, a lot of recovering to do, and, and certain members of the family have even more. So uh, these families are going to continue to need our thoughts, our prayers, and our support uh, to help them through this difficult process. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Chief Mons, who will go into detail on the circumstances of the incident and updates. Chief.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'll give you a recap of the uh, beginning from the dispatch we had on uh, Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon all the way until uh, our, our fire investigation team had their investigation uh, wrapping up yesterday. So on Tuesday, June 18, 2024 at 4.06 p.m., uh, the Syracuse Fire units were dispatched by the Onondaga County 911 Center to a reported explosion and structure fire at 205 Carbon Street. Firefighters from Station 2, located at 2300 Lodi Street, arrived first on scene and in under three minutes and found a collapsed two-story wood frame building with multiple injured people in the front and side yards of the home. The first two firefighters on scene immediately began triaging and treating the injured civilians. This was a very dangerous emergency scene consisting of down live power lines, a heavy odor of natural gas, and an unstable building collapse which had smoke coming from the rear of the structure. Besides the multiple victims in the yard, firefighters reported that one child was pinned in the driver's seat of a vehicle that had a portion of the collapsed house on it, and another injured child was walking away from the scene towards Butternut Street. Soon after, the remaining dispatch fire department units arrived on scene, including the initial incident commander who declared the scene a mass casualty incident which that ensures enough resources were dispatched, dispatched to handle the collapse and the many patients that needed care. An EMS and a rescue sector were established among the firefighters prior to prioritize each of these critical scene operations. All visible patients were removed from the rubble and away from the unstable collapse, including the child in the vehicle who was freed by firefighters after quickly showing the structure to stabilize the vehicle. This was a very chaotic scene with all firefighters and several civilian bystanders treating all patients that were found and carrying them to awaiting ambulances. In total, 10 victims were transported from the scene following the initial arrival of fire units. AMR transported nine of those victims with the Syracuse Fire Department ambulance transporting one victim. Initial injuries included second and third degree burns, body and head injuries that are consistent with an explosion. After those 10 patients were transported, there were still conflicting reports from bystanders to fire and police officials on scene that indicated that there were possibly still occupants trapped inside the rubble and that approximately 17 to 20 people were thought to have been inside the home at the time of the explosion. Fire crews stretched fire hoses to extinguish hot spot fires and other fire teams checked nearby homes for any injured occupants and a monitor air quality levels for signs of natural gas or any other toxic fumes or gases. Because of the conflicting reports of the people still un unaccounted for and possibly still trapped inside the collapse, firefighters from the rescue company, which is a specialized group of firefighters trained in collapse and confined space rescue, began the process of entering the building to check for any more trapped victims. With the help of several fire crews on scene, firefighters worked to shore up the collapse structure to mitigate any further collapse potential. While shoring was taking place, National Grid representatives at the scene utilized a backhoe to ensure that natural gas and electric to the structure was shut off at the street, making the area safer, safer for the firefighters to enter. When the building was safely shored, a team of firefighters of two rescue firefighters entered the remains of the collapsed building at approximately 6.04 p.m. This interior search and rescue team spent nearly 45 minutes meticulously searching the ruins of the home from the second floor, which was collapsed onto the first floor and into the basement area. In the meantime, at the same time, Syracuse police officers worked diligently to confirm that all reported occupants of the building had been accounted for, and at approximately 6.49 p.m., the rescue search team exited the building. The rescue team was able to search approximately 95% of the entire collapsed structure. This search was negative for victims. At approximately the same time the search team exited the structure, the Syracuse Police Department officers confirmed that members of two families, 13 people in total, had been at the site prior to the explosion. At this point of the operation, to ensure the remaining 5% of the collapsed structure was searched and to confirm there were no further trapped victims under the collapse, our department requested a team of live victim search dogs from Albany, New York, which was provided by Task Force 2 of the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, Office of Fire Prevention and Control. A short time after their arrival on scene, 
Two separate searches were completed by two separate live victim search dogs and it was confirmed the structure was cleared of any additional victims. To end the night of search and rescue operations on June 19th, on June 18th, I'm sorry, a New York State Police cadaver dog was requested to the scene from Marcy, New York to conduct a third and final search and again, it was confirmed no further victims, deceased or alive, were still inside the collapsed structure. On this night, high, high temperatures and humidity compounded the difficulty of the entire rescue operation. Crews of firefighters from across the city were rotated through the scene to provide relief. Centrals, like the mayor said, sent a bus to act as a cooling station for exhausted firefighters. Additional crews of off-duty firefighters were called to the scene to assist the rescue efforts. Also, additional fire units were placed in service in the city to ensure the rest of the city had adequate emergency response capabilities. More than 60 fire department personnel responded to the scene on that day on Tuesday. Personnel from AMR, Red Cross, National Grid, they all maintain a presence on the scene with the Syracuse Police and Fire Department through the entire rescue operation. After all the victims were confirmed, located, and transported for treatment, fire crews and other agencies began clearing the scene for the night. And then the scene was turned over to the Syracuse Police Department, who secured this scene until the morning. On the morning of Wednesday, June 19th, Syracuse Fire Department investigators, along with the Syracuse Police Department, National Grid, the New York State Public Service Commission, and an agent from the local Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms partnered to begin a joint investigation to determine the possible cause of the incident. First, pressure tests were conducted by National Grid and observed by personnel from the New York State Public Service Commission. There were no issues found with the natural gas line running from the curb box on Carbon Street to the home's interior gas meter. National Grid entered the basement, examined the gas meter, removed it, and capped it off. Due to National Grid's findings on the exterior of the building and with the meter, our fire investigators then began to focus their investigation on the inside of the collapsed home. The Syracuse investigation team, consisting of Captain Joe Fennell and Lieutenant Edward Lehman, along with the ATF agent, entered the collapsed structure to begin an interior investigation. Fidel and Lehman examined the interior natural gas lines inside of the building. The natural gas service entered the, structure on the, entered the structure on the Carbon Street side of the home. It was found that the gas meter fed multiple appliances inside the structure with two, nat with two natural gas pipelines that ran from the meter. One gas line serviced the furnace and hot water tank, which were located in the rear northwest corner of the basement. Another gas line <coughs> meter serviced the basement area where a clothes dryer would normally be <coughs> and a first floor stove. As this gas piping was examined, the Syracuse Fire Department investigators noticed that there was in fact no clothes dryer present, even though there was a gas pipe line servicing the area where the dryer should have been. This specific gas pipe had a shutoff valve on it, and it was found that that shutoff valve was in a fully open position. Also, the end of this piping had no cap on it, nor was it connected to any gas connector that would normally go to an appliance, meaning that natural gas was free flowing from the gas pipe. After Fennell and Lehman discussed their investigative findings with the ATF agent, the cause, the cause and origin of the explosion has been determined to be a free flowing natural gas leak from that gas pipe in the area of the basement where a dryer hookup should have been located. Like I stated earlier, this gas pipe had a shutoff valve found to be fully opened in a position that was chocked all the way open. And it was believed to be free flowing of natural gas at the time of the explosion. No other gas line in the basement showed any damage or evidence of any leaks. There was a few possibilities for an ignition source, but due to sci the scientific process of the investigation, the determination for an ignition cause and source will stay undetermined. Early on in the investigation, there was speculation that the car on the side of the house that the child was trapped in struck the house to cause a building collapse ex and explosion and fire. During the exterior investigation, that theory was ruled out. The only damage to the car was from debris from the collapsed house falling on that vehicle, and no damage to the vehicle or structure was consistent with the vehicle striking the building. Also at the time of this incident, 205 Carbon Street had no open housing code 
or maintenance code violations on the structure or any open work permits. After discussing the investigation findings with the Onondaga County Attorney District Attorney's Office and the Syracuse Police Department, no criminal charges will be pursued relevant to this case at this time. A total of 13 people were treated at Upstate Hospital. These are the conditions for the members of both families that were provided by Upstate to us yesterday by the Upstate Hospital staff, and I'll go through those. The residents of 205 Carbon Street, these were the people that were living in the house um, and not the visitors. A 42-year-old Fuj Alam Ben Abdul Rahman, he was previously stated and listed in stable condition. There was no update provided yesterday. Rajuma Begum Binti Dil Muhammad, age 33, previously listed in stable condition, also had no updated information provided yesterday. Muhammad Omar Ben Fajum Alam, 13 years old, was in good condition yesterday evening. Fermina Bajum Beniti Fajum Alam, age 12, was in good condition. Anuti Rahman Ben Fuj Alam, age 10, was in good condition. Najumo Hassan Ben Fuj Alam, age 3, previously listed in critically stable condition, had no update provided yesterday. The visiting family, Muhammad Alam Sayyad Alam, who was 34 years old, was in good condition. Yasmidi Nur Muhammad, age 29, was discharged. Ajadi Muhammad Alam, age 5, was in good condition yesterday. Sahani Muhammad Alam, age 2, was still in critical condition as of yesterday. Rajma Muhammad Alam, 8-month-old child, is still in critical condition as of yesterday evening. And the other visiting family member was Samaya Muhammad Alam, age 4, and she was not admitted into the hospital. I'd like to thank, like the mayor said, all of our partners from all the different agencies that assisted in this operation and with the investigation. Many of them worked inside the collapsed structure to make sure we can do everything we can do uh, to bring a safe and happy ending to anybody that we could. Um, to the bystanders on scene who selflessly provided medical care to the patients, thanks. Your work was amazing on Tuesday. I'd also like to publicly state how proud I am of our fire department members and tell them what an awesome job they did providing compassionate, critical care to the patients on scene as well as to thank them to be dedicated to their craft. When our constituents needed us the most, you were ready and you met every challenge. Finally, I'd like to send my prayers to the families of the victims and the neighbors who have all suffered through this terrible incident. That concludes our update. Um, Mayor Walsh, lead of fire investigator, Captain Joe Fennell, and myself will now take questions. Chief, how, is there any indication as to how long that gas was free-flowing or how long it could be before anyone in the home began to smell anything or feel medical conditions, or is it something that could have been around for a while without someone knowing? I'm going to, anything that um, is concerning the investigation, I'm going to have Captain Joe Fennell come and speak Please, to. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> To answer that question, we haven't, able, we haven't been able to determine how the gas valve has been turned on, but we did get indications that gas, there was an odor of gas uh, outside and surrounding the residence at approximately 9 a.m. Um, that morning. People had been again, smelling gas. They made no calls to 911 or to National Grid, so as far as we believe, it was at least since 9 a.m. in the morning. Can you speak to a history? Was there ever an appliance hooked up there? Had it been recently removed? Had the gas been shut off and recently turned on in terms of the free flowing? When speaking to the homeowner, he estimated he had owned the house for approximately four to five years. And he said in that area that there had never been any appliance. The hookup was always there, but he had never actually used it and had an appliance there. And the gas had been turned off to his knowledge and recently turned back on? I mean, if it was only smelled at 9 in the morning, was it a recent change to the, the usability of that, that gas? He did not smell gas until that time. And he said he, him and uh, he knew of no one else that would have messed around with it for any reason, turning it on or off. And so what's the, what's the thinking of how that ended up on? Uh, that's something that we're still investigating. We're still trying to figure that out. Uh, it was the, the basement kind of, it was limited access. It wasn't accessible to the public. So we don't believe that it was, um, again, anything criminal. It 
may have been someone accidentally turning it on and not knowing what it was. I know that the, sorry, go ahead. Was this house owner occupied or was it a rental? It was a rental. And who's, who smelled gas? Lisa mentioned that uh, there's no specific ignition point that's been determined just yet. So can you speak to how easy it would have been for that amount of gas to ignite? If it could have just been something as simple as a match or turning on a stove? Yes, yes, it certainly could have been. Uh, so natural gas, they, when we speak in terms of natural gas, we have a um, upper explosive limit where essentially there's too much natural gas to ignite and a lower explosive limit where if there's not enough gas to ignite. Um, there has to be a perfect fuel air mixture for that to occur, for that explosion to occur, and then it could be as simple as turning a light switch on. Uh, the arc from a light switch could, again, set that explosion off. Uh, in the basement where we believe the explosion originated, there was a refrigerator. There was also a natural gas powered water heater and also a natural gas furnace. Any one of those uh, in their normal operation, if they you know, would have turned on, could have been enough to set off that perfect fuel air mixture. Who did you say smelled gas as early as nine that morning? Was it the, the occupants? The occupants told me they had smelled gas for a while that day, but they couldn't pin down a time frame. The owner, who has an office next door, said he smelled it in the driveway when he arrived at that morning at 9 a.m. Do you know if the driveway was used or if it was just whoever there sitting there? The owner was able to tell us in the approximately four to five years that he owned the house, there was never a dryer there. Do, do you think gas would have been smellable if it had been on for days before? Would it have been noticed earlier than that day? So gas, natural gas in its natural form is colorless and odorless. Um, the odorant is added by the utility companies so it can be detected by people should there be a leak. Uh, the, the standard is at 1% of the LEL you should be able to smell the natural gas. So I don't believe that that was open for a substantial amount of time before someone smelled it. How hard was it for you as someone who investigates fire to, to, to go into a a collapsed structure and try to make sense of what's left over? We don't do it often, which is why we were glad to partner with uh, the explosive expert from the ATF, but uh, the, the, the city provides great training for us. Uh, we, we, we train all the time on things. Luckily, we don't have to use that training often. I have uh, a great team of investigators that assist me and also with assistance from the Syracuse police and. Um, assistance from the chief's office, really, we, we had everything we needed to get the job done. Would you describe what it was like in, in the, the deepest parts of that pile? Oh yeah, it was, there was a lot of ruin. There was a lot of, uh, again, things thrown apart. Uh, walls had collapsed, just, just the ceiling, it was the floor joists of the first floor were caved into the first floor, or into the basement. There was water leaking because, you know, the pipes had broken. It, it just, it kind of surreal. So explosions are usually, um, th th how powerful that explosion is, is going to depend on where it originates and how contained the gas is when it's finally ignited. Um, so while, again, the upstairs, some of the outside walls had collapsed and, and were relatively intact, the basement walls, which were made of concrete, uh, were cracked. And there was actually on one side of the house, there was probably a 18 inch to two foot section that was completely removed and blown into the debris pile. So the wooden sections of the structure, again, they, they'd been pushed over, but there was a pretty significant blast. Is the structure fully compromised with this fairground situation? Uh, that wasn't a decision, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> after the investigation was completed, uh, we brought in a contractor to help piece apart the building as as the long as well as when they were continuing the final parts of their investigation to try to secure any evidence that they needed um, at the time because the structure was so unstable we lowered it all the way to the ground and we are in the process of uh, removing that whole entire structure yes and, uh, chief for people at home are, who are concerned 
a lot of the clients hook up. Where does the responsibility with the utility company and where does it pick up for the homeowner? So the, the utility company um, has the responsibility from the curb to the meter and then from the meter inside the structure should be the homeowner or the landlord. And if there's anybody that's worried about any type of natural gas order, any issues with any electrical service, call 911. The fire department will respond and we will investigate and we will also bring National Grid with us. So make sure you have the experts um, come and look to make sure that everything is safe and set up the way it should be. Uh, the fine should have been capped. In addition to just a bell for loss, it should have been capped? Um, yes. That, that line should have been capped, uh, either capped or the um, shutoff valve should have been turned off. Yes. Is the cap meant to, if the valve is accidentally turned on, continually prevent it from leaking? The cap would have prevented a leak from happening if it was installed properly. And is there a code requirement that these are capped and is this a pending code violation now? Um, there's certainly um, code and um, directions on how you're supposed to maintain the installation and the maintenance of these um, appliances and the installation of them. So, like I said, uh, we always uh, suggest that you get a certified uh, installer to come and make sure everything is working right. And when you're not sure if you have an appliance that's already installed, call 911 or call National Grid to come and double check it. When you determined that the valve was open, did the valve itself have like a lever on it? Some of them have levers, others you need to use a wrench to move it. And they're very difficult to move. They're not just going to move in the wind. So either if it had the lever, someone could just reach up and do that. Otherwise, you'd need a wrench. I believe this one was just a quarter turn, correct? Yes, yeah, so it was a quarter turn valve yeah. that you could manipulate it with your hands. And, and so, Chief, now that you're back at the podium, um, I, I realize there's some, un, some uncertainty in exactly how it got turned on, but at this point, is it, is it feel that this was accidentally flipped on by someone in the home within 24 hours of the explosion? Um, the time frame is uncertain, but certainly, like I said earlier, we don't believe there was any criminal uh, or malicious intent of why that valve was open. Um, the valve was open. Um, we certainly wish it wasn't, but the valve was open, and that's part of our investigation that our team does, and that's why we brought in all the resources we did <coughs> with National Grid, the New York State Commission, um, the ATF. You know, our, our fire investigators, uh, Lieutenant Lehman and Captain Joe Fennell, they're great, but, you know, we had the resources available in every step of our process to get to a cause and origin. Um, we conferred and uh, talked with the ATF agent, and that's, they came to a conclusion together. So None of the occupants have had a conversation with you that they were the ones to touch the valve? No. So it's an unknown. Someone turned it on, and they, nobody knows who? Yes. Okay. And, and so with their investigation, if they can't specifically confirm that something in fact happened, it goes undetermined. Even there could be speculation. People could have all these assumptions, and there could be a lot of evidence leading to it. If you can't confirm and, in fact, say this definitely happened through a scientific method, you have to rule, keep it undetermined. So that's where we're at in this investigation. Just to touch on uh, when the homeowner was mentioned, we're talking about the landlord, right? Someone who wasn't actually living in the home? Correct. So that, so that person was the one that confirmed that there's never been an appliance hooked up to that line before? I'll let um, Captain Fennell just to make sure I, I got it right, yes, but yes. yes. Okay. Um, did he have anything to offer as to whether that had been explained to the, to the residents inside and what to do about that, anything along those lines, given it's, you know, people coming in from outside the country? Um, I think the question you're asking is a part of the reason why it's still undetermined. Uh, when we, you know, canvassed the uh, people that lived in the house that were able to still communicate, when we talked to the, own, the landlord and the homeowner, um, that information wasn't readily available so we can come to any conclusion to answer that question. Uh, just switching gears to those people, uh, it can be a little bit, I don't want to say that misleading is the right word, but people might hear upgraded to good condition in the hospital and think that they're, you know, up and walking around, but we know that that could still, they could still be in a bit of a dire way or faced with injuries that have permanently disabled them in some way for the rest of their life. Can you, can you talk about what kind of injuries they're actually suffering from? Um, definitely, like I said earlier, second and third degree burns. Um, they had crush injuries um, and um, injuries to their body, um, deformations of some of their uh, bodily areas and their head So um, that were consistent with some type of an explosion. So um, 
you know, no matter what type of condition you are in the hospital, until you're discharged and you get home and you're feeling better, um, nobody's ever out of the woods until you're discharged from the hospital. Um, certainly they're doing, there's some um, patients that are doing better than others in the hospital from 205 carbon, but uh, we're not gonna feel good until everybody's discharged, and I'm sure the hospital and everybody that worked on the scene feels the same way. Initially, three people were in critical <coughs> condition. Is it now two? Um, can you answer that, um, Matt? Yeah, so we received uh, updated information yesterday. I believe it went out to the press as well, and uh, I spoke with the representative from Upstate. The, the information that we were provided yesterday was what Upstate was able to confirm identity-wise. They did have information uh, regarding a couple of the other patients. I believe one of them was one of the other patients that was in critical condition, but they could not provide an update at that time on that patient. And I don't know if, if Mayor, you found out the, the two that are critical, precisely what kind of injuries they're suffering from? No? Okay. Were firefighters allowed to rescue the child from the fire? Did they get to the fire? Can you repeat your question? Were the firefighters allowed to rescue the child from a car? Um, yes, the child was in the um, driver's seat facing the structure pinned in between the door and the seat. Mm -hmm. and so they, they were only in the car? Yes. And why? Um, I, we're, we're not exactly sure exactly what was going on. We think they were getting ready to leave. Um, I think one of the adults was preparing to leave. Um, there was no uh, key in the ignition and the um, car was in park. So okay. um, definitely uh, the car wasn't running or anything like that. To the best of your ability, communicating with people who are in the hospital, um, have you been able to determine where people were in the home? Was anyone in the basement where this explosion would have happened? Was anyone nearby? I'm thinking of the most critically injured. Were they just closer to the blast? Is it because they're younger in age? Um, when we arrived on scene, there were patients all over the front yard. Some of them were very close to the rubble and the collapse. Some of them were not. Um, I don't know in the specific investigation, were you able to determine if there was anything closer? Um, no, we only had what we showed up on scene and what the bystanders told us, and uh, limited information was gained from our canvassing and investigation. And just to clarify number of patients, um, 10 were transported from the scene in an ambulance, but I believe it got to be 12 hospitalized. Do we, can we, do we clarify the difference of those two additional people? Um, I'm not sure how they arrived at the hospital, but at some point, um, two other people arrived at the hospital and they were treated and admitted into the hospital. The only, like I said earlier, one person was not admitted at that time, and there has since been one other person discharged. Who were the final two to arrive? Um, I'm not sure, I can't answer that question for you. Is there a, a lesson in this? Is there reassurance that your fire department can handle something so serious? What, what should you, your team, the community take away from this? Um, certainly, um, tra our training is our number one asset that we have, and. Um, um, just being able to be resilient to get to the scene and make split-second decisions and let your training take over. Um, you know, we're always worried about when we're operating on a scene like Caravan Street, making sure the other calls in the city get answered. So, you know, just making sure we're utilizing our resources to the best of our ability and giving our firefighters everything they need so they can provide uh, the care and service to our constituents. And just to clarify, just what you said, 10 were taken from the scene and who showed up? Yes, at some point, we had 10 transported in an ambulance from the scene on June 18th. At some, at some point after that, two other people that were in the house or around the house when the explosion happened ended up in the hospital at upstate. With respect to catching this early, or if there's another home out there somewhere in our area that, that might have a similar free-flowing gas line in their home, should alarms that can detect this kind of natural gas be more commonplace in homes? Well, like the Captain Fennell said, um, the odor is going to be your probably your number one um, hint that something is going on. As soon as you smell natural gas, you should leave the house, call 911, and let the experts come and National Grid come as the experts to figure out what's going on. So that's my advice to anybody that has any um, issues going on with any natural gas service or electrical service in their house. Is there a device that exists that could catch it if people like have trouble smelling or maybe they're ignoring it? Uh, they we, don't know what it is. we definitely have detection systems and there's certainly um, detectors that could be installed for this type of, but um, it's just not a common, it's just not a common um, detector that's in normal people's houses most of the time. Mayor, can you speak to whether there's a code that exists that, that an, uh, an unused valve needs to be capped? Now. Any more questions? Uh, 
um, just to be sure, I know you mentioned that there wasn't a dryer there and there hasn't been in 75 years, I believe. But was there an attention of putting the dryer there and that's how the property happened? Did the new appliance being put in? Based off the investigation and talking to the residents of the home and the landlord, we weren't able to gather any information to answer that question at all. Um, somehow that valve was turned open. We were not positive how that happened. I guess this is a good last question if uh, you're counting questions. The, um, what happens next? Is this considered done? Is this ruled an accident? Are you still talking to people who were in there? Are you still getting to the bottom of why or who turned on the gas? shortly before the explosion, what happens next? So the cause and the origin is, um, like I explained earlier, from the gas pipe. Um, we'll continue to talk to the patients, um, and if any more information comes forth that makes us open up the investigation and uh, go down a certain pathway, our fire investigation team certainly will do that in conjunction with the Syracuse Police and our other partners that have been investigating this situation. Thank you.